Welcome everyone. I am so excited to be talking about uh, my experiences of building a context-driven testing practice today. Um, one of the things, as Ali mentioned, I'm really, really passionate about is creating communities or spaces where fantastic testers can thrive. And um, one of the reasons why I like to immerse myself within organizations is because I can create these spaces where I see testers who come in with, with just some motivation and some passion in their eyes and I can see them develop to become these most amazing software testers and Ali is actually one of one of the testers who came to me early on in Sydney and said to me um, I want I want to become a, a great tester and how do I do that and we work to help Ali become um, the fantastic tester with the reputation she has now so I have a, a personal goal for myself uh, to help people do that, and it, and it brings me a, a lot of pleasure. Um, I have a little bit of background about having done this. Um, at the moment, I'm working at Tyra Payments. I've been there for about a year. Uh, working, we started with a um, test, it was called a test team at that time, um, of five testers. We're now a team of 24 context-driven testers, and I'm really, really excited about that. But prior to that, um, I learnt my bread and butter in test management really with Nortel Networks. I'm an electronic engineer by trade. I um, learnt software testing um, really through testing protocols. And when I went to Nortel Networks, suddenly I was in charge of this testing team. Um, and I learnt a lot about um, trying to manage people and and what that meant. Um, along that journey I became very disillusioned with testing um, and realizing that um, I felt, looking at that I felt was this all there was to testing. I went from a tester to a test lead to a test manager and I became very disillusioned with the test management that I was doing. Um, because of that I ended up contracting and I went off, at least as a contractor, you can get to choose what you want to do to some certain extent. Um, and throughout that, that, my career, I gradually became more and more aware of what it meant to be, to be a great tester. Um, and I wanted to build a, a context-driven testing practice. And that's been my goal. I, I got to have a go at that with the, in an R&D environment at Silverbrook Research. Uh, created a team there of about 12 context-driven testers, and we had a lot of fun. We had people like Kim Engel working there from New Zealand, Richard Robinson, and we had some great testers, and we had a really fantastic, thriving, healthy testing practice there. Um, but um, also, I just want to give you a little sense of who I am as well. Um, I came, I have, I am Irish, yes, that, that little slight accent that you hear is Irish. I came to Australia in the 1990s, mostly from a broken heart. Yeah, his name was John. And um, I remember arriving in Australia um, because, uh, and feeling like, well, this is mostly like, Ireland, right? I mean, we talk the same language, and a lot of Australians have an Irish heritage, so it's going to be so easy for me to come in and integrate myself. But when I arrived here, I found it was totally different. I found that, you know, I would go to a barbecue, for example, or a party, and, and all the men would hover over the barbecue talking to each other, and the women would be in a, another group on the other side of the room, and and, and people didn't really mix, and I was like, what is this? And, and then there was the Australian iconic sense of humor, that real dry wit, and I was like, is this really a joke or not? And so I found it really hard to um, integrate with that, and it made me realize what it must have been like. Um, it made me think about what it might have been like for the, the original colonists who came over in 1788, um, 215 years ago you know, what it must have been like to arrive in this strange and foreign land, and how they try to impose their English ways in Australia to the point where they nearly starved. You know, there was farming failures, seeds fa failed to germinate, they built their homes in the floodplains because that's what they did in England, but 
in Australia with with flash flooding, you know, you needed to build your housing on high up on hills. And so there was a lot of of chaos for them. This seemed to be a chaos, a chaotic and strange world. Uh, and they were trying to impose their English structure on that. But isn't that in some ways, you know, we laugh at that bit and we think, oh, how naive, but, but we do that in our testing as well. When we look at um, organizations where we're really working in, in such a chaotic environment, you know, especially with Agile now, we, we, things are changing at such a rapid pace. Technology, um, but even the products are changing rapidly. The ability to, to change our business um, needs have, has allowed us to change things really, really quickly. And so we're working in an environment that's in rapid change and constant flux. And yet our, our number one instinct when we, when we look at testing is to impose structure to impose an external uh, structure on top of this. And in some way, that helps us feel a bit secure. And so we've ended up with this situation where often you'll go into large organizations where you'll see this big formalized testing process. Um, they probably spent a lot of money writing this testing process. They spent a lot of getting external consultants to come in and write. I know this because I used to be one of those consultants that did that, and it cost a lot of money. Um, but, but they spent a lot of time and, and effort in, in formalizing and, and creating these external methodologies that they can put up in great tones on their, on their shelves and point to and say, this is our testing process. And underneath, to support that testing process, we often see loads of expensive tools like quality, the test center or the quality test manager, um, and they need these tools that, to support that testing process. And right, right down on the bottom, sort of kind of incidental, are the people, right? We have the testers, you know, and they are often seen as the dispensable part of the testing makeup. They're um, disposable, and often we see that when, when testers are replaced by other testers from a different part of the world. They're seen as a, a commodity that, that is disposable. And I think this is really, uh, many of you will identify, this is really contrary to a lot of the principles of context-driven testing. It's really hard for context-driven testers to thrive in this process. Um, so I wanted to change that, and I wanted to change and identify a new approach. And so I want to put a situation where we put the testers at the top. We put the testers central to the testing, the, the testing that we do. A team is only good as its people. And in order to do that, we need to focus on them and helping them be excellent in what they do. Um, that's not to say tools and process are not important. But if we put our focus on the testers, the, the the process and the tools allow us to support those people. So today I want to spend a little time looking at that. So when you think about, about a great tester or a tester that you want in your team, um, I think it's worthwhile breaking down a little bit what that means. The testing skills that we want, we want to have testers with a rep reputation of, of being excellent in what they do. We want, we want to have testers who aspire to, to be confident to handle any situation, to be skilled and really motivated to, to keep improving. But these testers aren't exactly easy to come by. And especially, you know, I've, I've, in Australia, we're small and very, very, very far away from the rest of the world. It's hard to entice people to come down to our wonderful country. Um, and we're faced, we, Tyra Payments doesn't exactly have a renowned name like eBay or Atlassian that instantly draws testers. So we have had to work really hard uh, to, to work with people who are not necessarily have amazing, you know, big names or are well, have, have great reputations, but we've looked at uh, 
finding testers who are passionate about learning and where we can help develop their testing skills and their credibility. So the things that we've been looking at at Tyro is one of the big things that we've been looking at is the ability to think critically about their testing. We want the testers to be thinking about, well, what is a valuable test? What is, you know, just because, oh, developer, you tell me that this needs to be tested, how do I know that, that this is the right thing to be testing? Perhaps the risk is elsewhere. Perhaps I should be doing testing in a different area. So we don't want testers who blindly follow what other people tell us to do, but we want them to be able to reason through uh, the, 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 te the testing challenge in front of them and to be able to make, um, to make decisions based on, some, on their logic. We also want, but we don't want the just that, do we? We want, we want creative testers. We want people who have new ideas to throw into the mix. Um, at Tyra, at the moment, what we have is um, we introduced the idea of having testers working very closely with developers. And this is not new. We see this a lot in different organizations happening where instead of having a testing practice, uh, the testers actually, or a testing team, the testers actually work side by side to developers. So we have about 12 teams at the moment, and we have one tester working with, say, seven developers, and they work very, very closely with the developers on testing, their, on testing the code there at that level. Um, but, but we found that this doesn't suit everyone, and we've had some testers who have actually really tried to work very closely with, with developers, but their mind has kept on jumping over to different areas. They're seeing risks in different areas of the organization. And because of that, we, we, we don't want to crush that. So what, what, I, what we've done at Tyro is we've allowed them to, to do different things. I have one tester in particular who kept on looking at the data of our systems and was really concerned that, that the data at Tyro needed to be investigated and explored and we needed to understand exactly what our, our data in order to be able to test well. And so instead of confining him to that role of working closely with the developers, we allowed him to just make choices about going off and testing and developing a strategy for the data for the whole of Tyro. So this one tester is now spending time working on all the schemas, working on all the uh, databases to really understand exactly where the data is going into, creating test data set so that exploratory testers can jump into and just quickly, rapidly roll out test data to be able to perform their exploratory testing instantaneously with lots of different types of data. They're also putting that um, in parallel to that, they're working with the developers to make sure that the data stays in sync with the changes that are being made. So it's all going into version control, and so that at any point at any version of the, the software that gets rolled out, we have a, a set of data that we can um, test against. It's really exciting, and if we hadn't, it, it's really exciting to see us doing that and see this tester really enjoy the work that they're doing. And if we had forced that one tester to remain in that team, with the seven developers, we would never have had this wonderful, rich te uh, approach to test to having test data. So we want the lateral thinkers in our team. We want people, as I said, who are fantastic at modeling. One of the things that we've done at Tyro to really help create a diversity of models is we've looked to increasing other people from different different parts of the organization. So we now have Marion, who comes from the business, who's had years of working as an accountant, who brings to us models of how the business work. We also have people from customer support that we're bringing in. We have um, testers, so we have testers who are focused on the technical models, but we also have testers focusing and bringing their expertise to the business models. And we need that rich diversity in our testing practice. Of course, we want strategic thinking. We want people who are constantly looking around, making decisions about what is the most 
what's the best approach for testing at this point in time based on the risk that is around us? Am I testing the right thing and how do I know I'm doing that? And without all these, without communication, all this wonderful stuff can often get lost and missed. And so we want our testers to be able to really explain what they're doing, explain to other people within the organization why they're doing what they're doing. So communication is massively important. And to a degree, we want some technical proficiency. Um, now, I don't, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole debate about whether testers should be able to code or not. But I really believe that having a level of technical technical proficiency that allows testers to be able to have a conversation to a developer is really essential if that's what they're doing spending their day, if that's the people they're spending their day with. But if that's not all. I don't think I don't think if you look at a tester and you look at all these things and you put them down and say, oh okay, I've got this critical thinking, I've got lateral thinking, I've got all these wonderful aspects, and now I've got the the fantastic, excellent tester that, that I want on my team. It's not enough. We need other things. And when I look at other characteristics about a tester that I would like in my testing practice, um, I look at things like independent, being able to think independently to work um, in isolation if they need to. They, they take a real responsibility for that testing. They want to own it. It belongs to them, and they want to make sure that they do the best job they can. They're responsible for their learning. If they have something that they need to learn, they go out and do it. My data guy, there were no models about the, the data. Um, and so he had to go out there and physically run transactions through the system and take snapshots in order to learn exactly where the data was going. This type of, it's this type of approach to learning that we want to encourage, we want to instill in our testers. We want them to be aware. I think self-awareness is so important for testers to be able to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Because in that way, for starters, they can explain it to other people. But also, the other thing is it helps them improve themselves. It helps them, if they're aware of their testing process, they can look at ways that they can improve that. If you're walking blindly through your process, unaware of what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's very hard to make changes. So that ability to have a meta level on your testing and to see where you can improve is something that we work hard at Tyro to help each and every tester be more aware of how they do things. But wait, there's more. Of course we need courage. We, you know, testing can be really hard, especially if you're in a team where you're one, you're, you're one person who thinks really differently to a lot of other people on the team. It takes a lot of courage to stand up and, and talk about your concerns when everyone is charging towards sending out a release. And we have to help our testers be courageous and instill that courage inside them. And, and along with that, it ha they have to be confident. The confidence, because when we have confidence in something, people around us instantly feel safe. If, if I am confident that I know what my team is doing, people around me start to relax. They, they realize she's in charge. She knows what she's doing. And we want our testers to instill that confidence in the team around us. So they have to portray an aura of confidence in order to allow them to get their work done. And of course, they want to be motivated to improve all the time. So how do you teach all this stuff? I mean, as I said, we have testers who have come in and they don't necessarily have a lot of experience in a lot of these areas. So how have we at Tyro have, have we taught people to become these types of thinkers? Because it's not something that you can directly teach, is it? I mean, it's not like you can give them a big manual and say, right, now you are critical thinkers. Now you're going to be creative. It takes, a, we have to work in a different way in order to help them learn these skills because a lot of these skills are tacit skill, tacit knowledge 
um, it's not obvious to people around us that what it is and they can't easily identify this on a piece of paper. And so one of the big things that we do at Tyro is we immerse ourselves in coaching. It's all about coaching at Tyro. And through the coaching, we can give people motivation, we give the people the skill, and we also help them be confident. And through the coaching that it, it allows these testers to, to have the freedom to, to try new things. So we want to help the, the testers through coaching become better at what they do. And so the coaching that we do at Tyro is very much based on the work James Buck and I have been doing with the coaching space and the coaching model. This is a, a Socratic method of coaching. It is very much directed around a task. So in many other coaching models you'll see that there are some, where you'll see a, a model where the, the coach is actually, um, doesn't really have a lot of experience about the, the task at hand. But, but in our coaching model it's, it's different. We say that the, the coach ha is also a tester. They also have experience in testing. And that helps the, the student be, that, that helps us directly in about, in helping them choose about testing. It helps them make decisions, it helps them get better at their testing. So as you can see in this model, we have, there's two sides to this model. We have a, a coaching tester, so there's the coach. But on the right-hand side, we've also got the student. And the, the model helps us, central to the whole model is we have energy. And through this energy, another word for energy is motivation. Um, and through this, through the coaching, we help uh, create energy. We help create confidence and motivation. So we, we, through the coaching and through creating a task, and having a task that we perform with the tester, we can help create this, this energy and this motivation. We direct the coaching through positive feedback. So if you have a look up here at the direction, at the top, what happens is we allocate a task to the, the tester, and as that tester goes through the task, the coach then identifies things that they can actually look at, positive, positive aspects of what the, the tester does. So you might notice something that the tester has done that's really good. You want to highlight that. You want to augment that. You want to be able to show how they could have done it badly. And you want to show them that, hey, this is really, really good work. You might see lots and lots of things through the coaching task that aren't necessarily good or bad, and, and you might have noticed those and observed those, but you might ne not necessarily want that to talk about that, that at that point in time. So you'll see things that you won't comment on. You'll see things that maybe the tester does that you think might be a problem. And you, want, you don't want to overlook those. You want to explore those. You want to... Uh, ask the question, ask the tester why, why they're doing that and help them think of other options to that solution. The key to this, this whole thing is that you're not telling the tester what to do. The tester is discovering through the task how to, to learn themselves and that brings the confidence and energy to, their, to the coaching space. And we have at Tyro, we do this so much. I'll just show you my, um, I'll show you my calendar for one week here. And you'll see that most of my days, coaching is sacred. I have blocked out all mornings um, to spend time coaching with the testers. And the testers know that at any time in the mornings, they can come to me. I will sit down. Um, every coaching task is always every coaching session is always based around a task. So I'll take my laptop, I'll sit with the tester and we'll work through some specific exercise related to them in their team. And that helps this task become really relevant to what they're doing at this point in time. 
And the testers have found this incredibly useful um, when they come to aspects which they feel challenged on and they want to they want some help in. I'm not giving them advice about what to do. They're discovering for themselves how to work through that, that, that problem. And this has been incredibly powerful in the team and it's really helped them become own, own the problems within their teams. So, but that's not just the only aspect of, of having a testing practice, a context-driven testing practice. We need to create an environment where people really can thrive. You know, I, I'm, I have to say I'm a big gardener. I love my garden. I spend hours in my vegetable garden take, pulling out weeds and creating pot compost. So it's not like I think testers are flowers, and, but I do use that analogy because it's something that I can really identify with. Um, and you never try, uh, and when, when you're a gardener, you don't actually go down and move a, fl a flower or, or try and get a flower to, you know, grow. You, don't, you can't make a flower grow, but you can create a context in which the flower, the flower can thrive. You work on the soil, you make sure there's sufficient water, you take out the weeds, and in the same way in a testing practice, your job as a, as a test manager or whatever your title is, is to ensure that the soil is fertile so that testers can thrive and grow. So there's other things that we've been working on apart from coaching to help do this. We really encourage cross-team support. One of the things that the testers do at Tyro is you can see them constantly pairing with each other. So they might be working with a team of developers, but if they see another tester who um, they feel that they can help, they'll pair with that tester. So there's lots of times I'll, I'll be walking around and I'll be seeing testers working on other teams. And I think that's really important because it also allows sharing of ideas. It allows the testers to feel supported by each other. But testing on your own in isolation can be really lonely too. So you've got that um, environment where you're working with someone that you can identify with, you feel supported. And that's really important. Um, we're big on communication, so we have our own stand-ups um, in Tyro. So the tester will go to the team stand-up and work there, but they'll also have our own testing stand-ups where we share information um, and let other people know what's going on. We have a Slack channel where we can communicate constantly. Um, the test environment channel is is always uh, always always active because you know we help each other by saying oh we're going to take down this test environment you know hold off testing over here because I'm just going to change the date over here. So there's a lot of communication that way um, that we can share with with each other. We also really encourage experimentation rather than telling people that where this is the one way of doing things. We, we do experiments. We don't impose a process, but we try something new. And this idea that we're constantly working new things, but we're happy to drop them if they don't work. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot recently has been pair testing with developers. Now, there's been a lot of talk in organizations about pair testing. I, I see it on Twitter, I see people blogging about it, and I'm like, oh, this pair testing with developers sounds absolutely amazing, let's give this a go at Tyro. And we started with it, um, and we were like, really? This, this sucks. <laughs> this is really, really hard. I couldn't understand why people were so positive about this pair testing uh, with developers. And so I was trying to figure it out. Um, now, I guess I should tell you at Tyro, the developers do a lot of pair, te uh, pair development. So they're constantly pairing together while they code. And I thought, well, maybe these developers, if they're so good at pairing with each other, they would then find it easy to pair with a tester, right? Because they pair all day, and so it should be easy for them to sit with a tester and pair and do testing together. And that'll be fantastic because the tester 
will learn more technical stuff and the developer will then get an understanding of what it means to test. But it kind of didn't work out like that. And I was looking at this and thinking, why are all these other organizations finding this so successful, but we're really, really sucking at this? And it occurred to me that, you know, pair testing is great, but it's not something personally that I would advise people to do all the time, every day. I think testers need to have their own space to think. They think differently, and it's unfair to get two people with two completely different mindsets to sit side by side all day and work together. Um, I think a tester should be allowed to go and work on their own. So sure, there are occasions where pair testing is with a developer is useful, but all day, every day, probably not such a good idea. And so, you know, this is one of the experiments we tried. However, we have found that some teams think this is wonderful and other teams think that it's not so good. So really, again, it's depending on the, the developers who are on the team, depending on the testers, sometimes these experiments will work and sometimes they'll be deemed a complete abysmal failure. And we should be allowed and we should allow our testers to make those decisions about whether to proceed in these types of experiments or not. And that way they own the testing in their team. And of course, you know, what without without social events, without that that time where we can go off and do stuff together, um, you know, going for lunches and encouraging external activities. We have a, a social team in our um, in our testing practice where people organize outings and, and we generally have external things that help sort of allow us to spend more time with each other and, and, and relax a bit in a different environment. But with all that, there's also one key aspect of having a great testing practice that I want to talk about, and that's leadership. Because in a lot of all this, there's this concept of a servant leader. We have this idea that the, the test manager, rather than that traditional concept of going in and, you know, reporting to the stakeholders about the progress of testing or, um, you know, managing volumes of test reports and metrics and, and, and doing all that organizational stuff. The, the shift of the test manager has to become coach and, and in a way, a, a servant leader, though I'm not very fond of that term. But the, the idea that, that somebody is there to support their team and to help their team thrive and grow. But there's more to that. You can't have a situation where that is all you do as a test manager. You need to balance this with a clear vision. Because without a vision of where you're going and what you're doing, people will think you don't know what you're doing. Um, and so we need to be able to tell our testing story. We need to be able to tell other people in the organization what we're doing and we need to instill confidence in the rest of the organization that we know what we're doing. Because this type of, of management is very, it, there's nothing explicit to show and so if we don't tell our story, if we don't let others know what we're doing and we don't display a, an aura of confidence, then people will fill in their own version of the story themselves. You know, this, this was something that I've really learned recently because at Tyro we don't do any reporting, external reporting in the sense of uh, reporting up. People trust us to do a good job and we, so we don't have to create volumes of reports to demonstrate our testing. We don't have to do uh, volumes of uh, session-based tests. We don't even do session-based test management at Tara because we don't need to show that information to other people. Um, but without that, any, any clarity, without any explicit 
information, um, we need to be able to show people that um, the testing that has been done is of high quality and that we know what we're doing. So in order to do that, we need to have a list of non-negotiables. You need, as the test leader of whatever your title is or non-title, you need to be able to ha know for sure your boundaries. What are you not going to negotiate on? At Tario, some of the things that we don't negotiate on is we will not we will not do volumes of test cases. We will not report on test cases. Um, if something has to be performed by um, performed from a compliance organization, and we're working in finance sector, which is traditionally has a huge amount of um, of reporting and is very um, very risk intolerant. They they don't like a lot of change. Um, we, we're in there, and so we, we're in an environment which is used to traditionally having volumes of test strategies and test documents and test reporting and test metrics. So one of our non-negotiables is we refuse to deliver that. If something needs to be delivered from a compliance point of view, we'll provide an automated check. Now, having said that, we also refuse to do some things at Tarot. One of them is BDD. Um, because we don't want our testers responsible for automated checking. And these are just one of our non-negotiables that we at Tyro believe and aspire to. We will not move on this um, uh, until there is a valid reason for us to do so. I have to add that because I'm a context-driven tester and there are no absolutes. However, this is something right now we will not budge on. And it's very important that you are clear in that story to your stakeholders and that the rest of your team or your practice understands that in themselves as well. Um, you need to help your testers look good. You know, it's tough out there. The testing world, being a tester in a lone team can be really, really tough. And so your role as a test leader is to help them look great. And one of the things that we do a lot in Tyro is getting the testers to tell their testing stories through blogs. So we have an internal blogging system. The testers are required to put testing stories out there. And this really encourages them, and this helps them to create a reputation within the organization. But it also helps them to tell their story. It helps other people know what they're doing. One of the big things also I've been working on is having other people tell your story for you. Um, it's part of my goal has been I don't want myself to come in and be the only person telling the story. I want my dev leads, I want my managers, I want the CEO to come down and say this is what this is how it should be. These testers know what they're doing. And so we have a lot of work, I do a lot of work to help the dev leads understand what we're trying to achieve and to get them on board. A recent thing, a recent success that we've had in this area is that we've had dev leads are coming to us now asking us to train their developers in testing. And this is a significant um, victory for us because this means that when people come and ask for assistance, that means they're open to the new ideas. If I had gone in there and imposed the learning on top of them, there would, the, it would not have been half as receptive as it had been that they come and ask for it. So really um, working hard to get your other people around you to advocate for your testing can be a powerful way of getting the message across. And of course, I think you know, at a high level, whilst each tester is responsible for the strategy within their own team, you as a, as a test leader needs to be focused on the big goal. Where's the vision? Um, do, is this approach working for us? What do, we need to, what do we need to refine? Are we focused on the real risk? Um, what we've noticed at Tyro is, is constantly our the, are what we have defined as risk changes rapidly. And so while 
six months ago we would have been focused very much focused on looking at functional risk we've now moved away from that and we are identifying other types of risks that are really important to us and so our strategy has to adapt to that and and then when we look at that we have to ask ourselves is what are we putting the testers are the testers being focused in the right areas do we have enough testers to support the type of work that we're doing do we need to hire more testers so these sorts of things are, are areas that the test leader or the test manager needs to be thinking about one of the things I, I would encourage you to do though because you might be looking at this going oh my god how am I going to get all this stuff done um, and, and certainly I got to the point a couple of months ago where I suddenly realized that I, I was working so many hours to try and get all this work done I was looking at the coaching, I was doing all this um, external stakeholder management, I'm um, focusing on going to meetings, I'm trying to hire people, and I started getting really overwhelmed with all this stuff, and I call it stuff, and any test manager out there who has been a test manager for a while will know what I mean by stuff. It's all that little stuff that you have to do throughout your day that just seems to consume you. <laughs> and I decided, you know what, I'm going to drop this stuff. I am, because the focus of my, my responsibility is to, number one, is to the organization, but that means it's also to my team. It's to my, it's to my testers. And I need to focus on helping them grow. And if I'm not spending time coaching, and if I'm not spending time helping them grow, then the whole thing isn't going to work. So. I dropped stuff and the way I dropped stuff was I basically handed it out to the team I made this Trello board I listed all the things that I did that I felt I did any I didn't really have to be doing um, that maybe the testers could be doing as well and I allowed them to choose the areas that they thought they were interested in so for example um, hiring new testers and so a lot of a few testers were really passionate and really interested in that area. I didn't know that. So actually putting that on the board and asking people to put their names to that helped me recognize these were things that people were interested in. Other things like audit. So, you know, if we were faced with an audit, how could we do we have a story to tell? And some testers I discovered were really interested in being part of that too. And so we went down the list and, and people gradually, you know, people were adding their names to the different areas and this was fantastic. Suddenly I had a whole, a whole set of tasks or stuff that I didn't really have to do. Um, and so this really helped take away a lot of the, the, the feeling that I had all this stuff I had to do. And it really, as a side effect, it actually is helping the other testers take more responsibility for working as a community, working as a practice. So, back to the garden. I think you need to have a clear vision for your garden. Um, this is one of the key things. You need to know exactly the limits of your garden, you need to know where your garden, where you, how you want your garden to look like in the future. Um, you need to know the boundaries of your garden and what you are will and will not do, and you need to make that clear vision to other people in your organization. You know, you've got to have zero tolerance for weeds. If you see stuff that's happening that that goes against your boundaries or your clear vision, you need to pull them out straight away. And this is part of your job as a, as a leader in, the, in your community. You are on, you're on the hunt for stuff that is, might stop the testers doing the job that they, are, they need to do. Um, you want to spend a lot of time cultivating the ground around you, creating a habitat, creating an environment that helps your testers to thrive and grow. And finally, I think it's really important to recognize that you celebrate the beauty. We realize that this is a wonderful thing that, that we have, we've got going at Tyro. People are so excited to be part of the team. They're, they're part of the vision. They're part of the vision of Tyro. 
um, they have an opportunity to thrive and grow. And yeah, sure, there's there's moments where where things get really tough, and, and it's we struggle to to and we question ourselves and we ask ourselves if we're doing the right thing or not. But at the ultimate, we know at the at the ultimate goal is we know that what we're doing is has a great value and we are learning and growing along that journey. So I think that's it for now. Thanks very much to hear, uh, for uh, listening to me rant about my garden. Um, just on the side, it is winter over here and my garden is just slowly coming to um, to fruition. I've, I've just weeded out the vegetable garden and I've put in my potatoes and I'm eagerly looking up every day to see if they grow. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at this point on, on the testing practice or gardening, whichever you prefer. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Ali. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That was a fantastic presentation, and I do love the, the garden al analogy. I've learned a lot of stuff. I've taken a lot of notes here that I'm, I'm going to take back to work on Monday. Um, I've, I've got a couple of questions here from, from uh, people in the audience, and um, if anyone else has any more questions, you guys can continue asking, um, and um, if we don't have time to answer all of them, we, um, we'll find a way to answer them afterwards, either um, through Twitter or, or the blog or, or, or um, however we, we can find a way there. So the first question I have here for you, and marie is from Damien, and um, he is um, asking, if um, going back to your coaching model that you're talking about that you and, um, and um, James have, um, so does, does um, any of that coaching, that does, sorry, does failure exist in that coaching model? And if it does exist, what does it look like? And how do you recognize that, that um, failure? In that coaching model, does failure exist? Yeah, is that is that the question? Correct. Um, I don't know really what you mean by failure. Um, failure, as in uh, failing for I guess there's low. I'm not sure if I really identify with that concept of failure. Is there a point where you cannot coach someone, or someone doesn't want to be coached? I guess that's yeah. I, I think uh, any. any any Damon saying exactly that you know if there is any um, complicated part to this to this um, whole process um, um, and you know if let's say someone doesn't want to get um, um, coached how, how do how do you go about it or if they don't respond well to the coaching that you are um, are doing how, how do you guys tackle that okay so I mean I think there's there's two aspects here it's really easy to coach people that you hire because you know you hire them for specific things. So when I hire people for my testing practice, they're, uh, they're willing to learn, they're engaged, they're enthusiastic. Um, I look for, I don't necessarily look for testers who have a, a huge reputation for their excellence in testing, though I'd love to, um, but, but I, also, I, I look for people who are eager to learn and willing to try. Um, so in some ways, when you're hiring people, you tend not to have this problem. Um, but there are um, occasions where you don't have, you're not afford, afforded that luxury, right? So you've got people that you go into a, a testing practice or a team, and these people have been there for a long time. I think um, it's much, much harder. Uh, in, for some of these testers to to be coached, um, and if if people ultimately don't have the energy for it or or feel they cannot be there, then it, they don't really have a place in my organization and my testing practice, um, and I have to act on that because it's not fair on the rest of the organization, or if, and it's not fair. I'm not doing my responsibility as a as a test lead, um, if I'm allowing people um, who are not willing to learn and not willing to engage to be part of my testing practice, and I have to act on that. And that's a very good point. And, and Katrina was asking a question very similar to that, which is um, it's much easier to um, to teach people and to coach them when you hire them because you create those expectations from the very beginning. Um, but the testers that we inherit sometimes uh, are not as willing to go through change or to coaching as um, as the ones that we we hire ourselves. So um, I, I face that you know sometimes as well. I have in the past. 
how how do you um, do you first try to to um, help them see the value in coaching, or you just um, how do you tackle that particular situation when when you inherit some, um, someone that's not really willing to go through that that process and doesn't see the value yeah. in them? I I have I mean I've I've inherited testers you know before and so I give everybody the same opportunity in coaching to learn. Um, I don't distinguish between, you know, oh, well, I've hired you, ergo, I'm going to keep you coaching, but tester who's been there for 25 years. I mean, I think there's, you, you have to give everybody the opportunity to be coached and you have to believe in them. Um, and you have to believe that they have the skill and the ability to do a fantastic job. Um, and you have to let them know that. Um, you do have to, one of the things that we did when we first started, I uh, started working at Tyro was to um, have a workshop where we all agreed what it meant to be a skilled tester. And so we made a pact at the start that this is what it meant to test at Tyro. Um, and with that, and this was something that everybody agreed to, so it wasn't just me saying this is what you must now do. Everybody agreed that this is what it was going to take to, to do testing at Tyro. And so, for that sense, I had buy-in from everyone. Um, now, when we, when we went through the coaching and um, it turned out that maybe that a certain tester didn't really want to do that, then I had something to point to. So he said, hey, look, you agreed to this. This was your you know, this was part of, you were part of the pact. You, you made a deal at the start that this is what it was going to be to take and, and I need you to, to do that. Um, so I think that helped, that, that set a benchmark for where we wanted to be. Um, but I guess, you know, um, just because, um, there's two things here. Just because someone has been with an organization for a long time doesn't mean that they don't have ability, they don't have skill. And you can absolutely fan those flames and you can get people. I've got people on my team who, you know, they've been with the organization for a few years. They're amazing, right? They have, they, they've seen the light. They, they've gone, oh, wow, I've got a wonderful opportunity here to learn, to do things that I had never done before. And they've thrown themselves into the effort. They've, they've really aspired to to being to doing the best they can do, and I think that's I'm really humbled by that they would do that for me um, and for themselves. Um, but there's testers that I've I have to be frank I've had to let go. Yeah. So you know um, it's not easy. It's much harder with a team that that you don't that you haven't built from the start. It is possible. You need to give them the same. You can't have a different standard for for them. You, you need to have the same standard that you do your testers that you hire, but um, I think you you have to they have to help themselves get there, and you can you can help them to a certain extent, but it's really their responsibility. Um, and at the end of the day, they have to make the decision whether they want to step up to that responsibility or not. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, you really can't force someone to learn if they're not willing to. It's um, it's just not not how it, it works. Um, you, you can't force someone. Sorry, you can't force someone, yeah. but you can't lower the standard. Either. Exactly, absolutely. So, yeah. So, um, and Marie, you mentioned as well in your coaching model um, that the coach has experience. So, different than other coaching models, when um, the coach doesn't have a lot of experience, in, in your coaching model, uh, the, the 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 coach has to have experience, obviously, in testing. So, how much experience exactly does someone need to have to be able to coach someone else in the team? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so you, if you, I put the coaching model up there, you'll see that um, there's a certain amount of duality. Um, if you look, I haven't got a pointer, but if you look at, say, the coaching tester on the left-hand side, you'll see all these different attributes of what a tester might have. So you'll see context, uh, the image that the test that that the coach sees as themselves that they do see themselves, how they aspire to, their expectations, their actual ability, and and how they appear. Um, and these, these attributes w exist for a, the coach, as a coach, but also as a tester. 
And so there is a duality there that, that you'll experience if you're coaching testers, that you'll have a, um, a certain amount of experience as a coach and a certain amount of experience as a tester. I think the more experience you have in testing, the more you're going to be able to help, but that doesn't mean that you can't coach um, people if you have a little testing experience. It's just that it's going to be a lot harder. But you might be able to balance that out because you're a great coach. So you might have, for example, your ability as a tester might be low, but your as a coach, you, you've got great coaching experience. And so you're able to compensate your, your testing ability. But I have to say, when I work with testers, it's hugely beneficial to be able to know what a testing strategy is. And it's hugely beneficial for me to have experienced what it means to make decisions about risk. Um, one of the first things I did at Tyro when I started working there was to become a tester for three months. I sat in the team with a group of developers because I wanted to experience and I wanted to know the challenges that my testers were going to be facing in the future. So, you know, I can sit there, I've got the authority, I know um, what it's like to work on, on the battlefront um, and I can help them because of that. So, I think you can compensate for, for not having testing ability, but you can also put yourself in a situation where you're saying, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn what it means to, to be um, a really good tester. And you don't, you can do that any time. I mean, I've been testing for nearly 25, 30 years now, and I'm still prepared to sit there with a bunch of developers and do testing. And I think you have to be, as a test leader, you have to be prepared to do that. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. Leading by example, um, we should all learn how to do that. Okay, Anne-Marie, uh, that's all we have time for. Um, we have a couple more questions that we, we didn't answer. Um, we'll, um, we'll get back to those uh, probably through um, the blog. So um, thank you so much, Anne-Marie, for, for sharing with us and for, for spending the time. I've, I've, like I said, I've learned a lot. And I'm sure that everyone else um, uh, attending also did. So thank you for all the attendees as well, all your questions. And um, until next time, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.